guy accused me that I was off an amp. No, he said he was an off me. And he ended up being in the racks more of that turn than I believed him finally. <laughs> so it was like a hands-on demonstration of the kind of motion. You were launching your sessions. Launching your No, no, no. No. See, you guys, when you go elsewhere in your lives, everything you do in physics doesn't Occupy every second of your of your thoughts. There's sometimes you just do stuff. You're not thinking, oh, this should be a collision, and all of so much fun calculating. It. <laughs> just, just, just do something once in a while. <laughs> we'll make it a little bit more. All right. If you remember, on uh, on Monday we had just gotten to the point. We were, we were working on this business that for every linear piece we had, how do you like today's new job? Is that all right? Back in the room? Want to get some sunglasses? Do you have awesome. green? What? Do you have green? Nope. Not on me. I do in my collection. <laughs> I'm, I'm, working, I'm working through the colors that for every linear variable we had, we come up with a, an exact complement of it for the rotational motion, so much so that all we had to do is swap the variable, use the very same equations, and keep going. The ideas weren't terribly different, a little bit different, but not terribly different. Every single thing we did had a rotational equivalent from position to velocity to acceleration and of course time and I'm not going to bother with there's no such thing as linear or rotational time but uh, then uh, um, the, the constant acceleration equations took exactly the same form um, everything was 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 spot on was there anything else we had in there some else we've come across so far no, we didn't actually get to kinetic energy. We we're just on the verge of that right now. Yeah, all the units. Yeah, all the units had a, had a parallel to them, but uh, I guess that was it. I guess that's all we've managed so far. But then we were working on kinetic energy. So we had this, this idea that if something rotates, as it rotates, every single little piece of it rotates. Every single little piece. Uh, and we took a look, uh, we picked a, a little piece of mass right there. And depending on how far away it is from the center and whatever the angular speed was of this thing as it rotates, we can figure out the velocity of that little piece of mass, M1. However big or however small it might be, we can, we can say that. Uh, we've looked at a couple other pieces. We have to look at them along the same line, but they don't need to be. They could be anywhere. We could take a piece over here and we could figure out based upon how far, oops, R1, based upon how far it is away, R2 from the center, we could then figure out its velocity at that instant. And so on. We could do so many little pieces of mass of this thing that we end up describing the entire thing. We can, we can, and we can say however small we want those little pieces to be. We could let them be uh, a centimeter on the side if we want. Or we could say, ah, that's too big even. Let's go down to an atom. Let's call each little piece of mass an atom until do all that mass atoms that make up this entire thing. Every single little piece of them. For extra credit, I'd like someone to do that atom by atom by atom. Write it up and turn it in. We can do that for all these little pieces anywhere they exist. We could figure out. how fast each piece of mass is going. Every single piece there has some kinetic energy and we can add up all of those pieces to get the entire 
kinetic energy of the of the whatever the object is. We'll add up from the first piece all the way up to the nth piece. However big we want nth, maybe maybe a hundred would satisfy us. Hundred pieces. Divide the thing that's rotating up into a hundred pieces. Figure out the kinetic energy of each little piece. Or maybe we want uh, n to be ten thousand or ten million. Or what's a bigger number than ten million? No, that's too big. <laughs> if it was infinity, we'd be here all week. Eleven million. Eleven million is bigger than ten million. So, however small we want these pieces to be, the smaller they are, the bigger n is. But the point is, we get the entire rotating thing characterized, accounted for, and uh, it's it, the, the tendon kinetic energy with every single little piece. Even the fact the pieces in close aren't moving very fast, they still have some kinetic energy, not a lot maybe, but they still have some. The pieces farther out are moving faster, they have more kinetic energy, but we total it all up. For every single little piece. I won't put these uh, indices back in, but they're all there. And we we'd, uh, we'd then know the entire kinetic energy of that object. Even though the object itself isn't going anywhere, all the little pieces that make it up are going somewhere. Every little piece has kinetic energy, even though the object as a whole is not going anywhere with its own velocity. The center of mass of the object isn't going anywhere because it's still basically right there. So we were just working on that business a little bit, the summation thing. Any, any, uh, any uh, uh, common factors come out, so of course that's the, the one half comes out, and then uh, we've got uh, this V, um, the velocity of each piece in there. But we'd also realize, well, the velocity of each piece depends upon how far that piece is away from the center and how fast the object is rotating. So we replaced V with R omega and we had then Ri omega squared. Right, that's all. That's all uh, sort of a quick summary of the last 10 or 15 minutes of the class on Monday. And uh, omega, of course, is the same for every piece on there. They're all part of the same object. That object's rotating at some angular speed omega. It's got to be the same for all the pieces. Otherwise, some parts of it would rotate at some speed and some parts would rotate at another speed, and that wouldn't make any sense. So the omega can come out, and we're left with the sum of m i r i squared. Is it omega squared? Oh yeah, omega squared. Yeah. Well, it isn't. Now it is. Now we are just getting to the point where we can take a look at that thing there, that sum of mi ri squared. Let's do what you did, the kind of thing, let's do the kind of thing you did in calculus, which is why I want you to have taken it before you take this class, so you're familiar with this kind of thing that we're going to do. Let's let mi go smaller and smaller and smaller and small until we can get the absolute smallest possible we can. This is the same thing we did with delta t when we were working on instantaneous velocity and instantaneous acceleration. We just let delta t go so small, we let it go to zero and use that as an accurate picture of everything that was going on because the size of delta t was so small, it didn't matter. We'll do the same thing with mi. We'll let mi, for the most part, go to, to zero. Um, Maybe, maybe. Uh, well, uh, what we, what you, that, what happened with that when we did that with the time, 
is what we were really talking about was not delta t, but then it became dt as we got the differential. So this then becomes, this piece here then becomes ri, well we don't even need the i in a second because of what's going on, r, r squared dm, where the, the mass, the little piece of the mass is so small, it's now a differential element. Remember that from calculus? That's our, that's our little tiny, that's essentially zero. And remember when you did this calculus, you didn't sum up all those pieces, you actually integrated them all. So that sum then becomes the integration of over the entire object of each little tiny piece and how far it is away from the center. The square, how far it is away from the center. And we can do that for any object we've got. Whether it's a nice circle like this, we could do that. If we were letting uh, uh, something like a big cylinder rotate, maybe about a point through its through its axis, and it's all we could we could do that integral for all of those pieces as well. We could do it for any kind of shape, actually, if we wanted to. I know how you love integration, so I'm sure you would like to do all those integrals. Every time we have an object rotating in a problem, you integrate this so that we could figure out the kinetic energy of it as it rotates. Phil, you love to integrate, I bet. You probably do it at breakfast. For the rest of us, would rather not integrate. Let's let somebody else do these integrations of, of disks and cylinders and spheres and axles and all those regular type of things we see that rotate. Let somebody else do those integrations and then just put them in a table for us and we'll just look them up. While Phil's off integrating at breakfast, we'll just look up this integration because why should we do it when somebody else has already done it? And so the table of these integrations is in your book. And in fact, all these integrations have a nice name. This is known as capital I, the moment of inertia. The term moment is, is more a mathematical term. Um, and uh, uh, inertia, remember, has to do with, with the mass of an object. So for very regular, ordinary, everyday solids, this is in your book. And our book has it on table 12.3, uh, 3, page 382. So if you got your book, you can take it out and take a look. Patrick, get your book out take a look. Just all my instructions. All right, look something like that. There's some nice, regular, everyday solids. Page 383. Sorry, 382. Page 382. There's some nice, everyday solids that uh, look very much... I guess I'll put it up here on the projector for everybody to see, since people like Patrick evidently didn't bring his book. I'm not done with it yet. Okay. Didn't go anywhere. It's right there. Alright. Just hasn't gone anywhere. All I did see I put a, okay. a square a square thing under something means I'm working here. I'll be back soon. In a minute. See you don't ever want to ask me a question while I'm waiting for the uh, projector to warm up because I have time to answer you. <laughs> ask me questions when I don't have time and I can care less. Oops, I not want that kind of thing on tape. All right, so they, for those of you who don't happen to have your book, Patrick, there's, there's the deal here. Uh, over here on the right side column is just simply the result of all these integrations. 
look up, uh, some of them actually come out as simple as MR squared. Some others, are, they're all factors like MR squared, but they get some constant in front, just the result of the integration. Phil will give us a little report after tomorrow's breakfast on that. What you have to be very careful with is notice that some of the objects, or, or four particular objects, like these first two, it's the very same thing. It's a thin hoop in both cases, but the ro way it's rotating is very, very different. In the first thing, it's rotating kind of like a wheel is. In the second one, it's rotating kind of like a wheel isn't. You know, it's rotating like uh, everybody's done that thing where you've taken a, a coin and flicked it on the tabletop so it starts spinning on it, twirling on its edge. That's that's kind of the picture that's here. It's a, it's rotating about an axis that goes up across a diameter. Notice the moment of inertia for those two things is very, very different. That's because some of the mass is at a different radius in one than it is from the other. It's the distribution of the mass with relationship to how the object's rotating, where it's rotating around, that determines its moment of inertia. Where, thing, where that mass is, where it rotates, changes everything. Uh, a disc or a cylinder, it doesn't even matter how long it is if the rotation axis goes down the center of the cylinder. If it's wobbling about uh, uh, perpendicular rotation to that to its own axis, then the length of it matters. That kind of makes sense, I guess. If you've ever grabbed anything simple like a, like a, a broomstick and twirled it, you can tell that it's, it, it got some, some, it takes some effort to, uh, to do that with it. And in fact, that's even the type of picture then we have down here. If you grab the boom stick in the center and twirl it, it's not too big a deal. If you grab it at one end, it's going to take a lot more effort for you to do so because its moment of inertia, as you'll notice from the calculation, is four times bigger when you grab the very same object from one end than if you do through the center. Because there's more mass a lot farther away at a bigger R than there is from this from the center. Then the last two sphere about a center and then a thin spherical shell. That'd be like a like a like a very thin like an egg shell if eggs were round. Um, but they're not. They're kind of like um, kind of like eggs. But notice the moment of inertia for those two situations is quite different, even if the mass and the radius were the same, because it's a very different distribution of math, mass with respect to that center of rotation. So we get these, these different values for the moment of inertia, and now, if I put this all back together, Sorry to make you wait for it, but here it is. I get the kinetic energy of an object rotating, even though the object itself is really not going anywhere, it's still right where it is, which we normally would have taken to be a V of zero when we were looking at particle motion. Now just the fact that it's rotating gives it some kinetic energy. Rotational kinetic energy. Notice how similar this looks to the linear kinetic energy. So there's linear K, there's the rotational K. Look how similar they look. You swap out V, put in omega, just like we did for all our other equations, take out V, put in omega. But now we can do the same type of thing with mass. When we had a discussion on the linear kinetic energy of mass, we now have a rotational 
mass. And we can now figure out the kinetic energy of a, just using our table now to make the swaps that we made before. So something doesn't actually have to be going anywhere. As long as it's doing something, it'll have some kinetic energy. This is the very idea behind a flywheel, if you've ever heard of such a thing. Uh, it's, it's the idea if you can get this big, heavy mass spinning up to some speed, you can use that to store energy for you until you need it. There have been car designs that have tried to use that where part of the braking of the car to bring it to a stop is done by using the loss of kinetic energy of the car as it comes to a stop to increase the kinetic energy of the flywheel so that when you get up to the stop sign, the car's not going anywhere. The car sitting there has no linear kinetic energy, but there's a whole bunch of rotational kinetic energy all stored up in the flywheel. And then when the light turns green, they engage the wheels of the car to that spinning flywheel and use that spinning flywheel now to bring the car back up to speed as the spinning flywheel slows down. very efficient use of kinetic energy. You're transferring the linear kinetic energy to rotational and back again over and over and over through stops and starts. The trouble is those flywheels are very, very heavy. So not only do they have to be accelerated, uh, uh, even, even if they're spinning down as they speed the car up, that mass of the flywheel still needs to be accelerated. So you've got this very heavy car because you've still got the engine and the wheels and your mother-in-law in the seat there and a brother-in-law in the back. And that, that's a lot of mass to move. So it's, it's not the most practical way to use kinetic energy that you lose coming to a stop to speed up the car as you go to a more practical way to do it is to use that loss in kinetic energy to run a generator, charge a battery, then use the energy saved in the battery to make the car go when the light is turned green. And that's what typical hybrid cars like the Prius and the Honda Civic and the others uh, all do now for their, for their uh, to, to use this loss in linear kinetic energy coming to a stop to then increase the kinetic energy when it's time to accelerate. But we could, could do it with flywheels. It's just not all uh, terribly practical. Alright, so let's, let's do a little, a couple little things with this kinetic energy. Uh, I mean, with this moment of inertia, in general, it's that integral. But in specific, we don't want to do that because it's already done here for a whole bunch of regular solids. Also, if there are a couple objects that are rotating, we can figure out the kinetic, the, the moment of inertia of each one of them individually and then just add them up and that will give us the total moment of inertia of an object. For example, we'll do a, a real quick uh, example. Imagine we have something sort of like a space station or some kind of satellite might be. Maybe we can model it very simply as four rather heavy pieces. Maybe each one is a different uh, experiment or module on a space station or one's a telescope, optical telescope, one's a radio, radio telescope, the other's trash can, and the other's an MP3 player. All the things you need on the space station. And imagine they're hooked together by very light 
structural members just to hold them in the place they need to be. Remember, there's no gravity in that space. So you don't have to actually hold anything up. You just have to keep it from floating away. So let's imagine each one of these modules has a mass m and is separated by a distance of 2r. So we have this, this, these very heavy masses <coughs> connected by very, very light structural members. And imagine we decide that we better see what it's like if we expect it to rotate on that axis. Things in outer space uh, sometimes are given a little bit of a spin to them that helps stabilize them. So we want to figure out the moment of inertia of this entire space station assembly, this very simple model of one. We need to figure out, well, how much kinetic energy do we need to give it to spin at a certain rate where we're going to get that energy? Those kind of things are, are calculations we might make. All right, so first thing we do is check our table. Is there in there the moment of inertia of a four module space station? There is? Oh, you're, you have the special edition. Because they're special. Uh, no, there's not. However, we, we can say, well, you know, if, if we've got these masses at a distance from the center let's just use the original form of this we had and just sum up for each of the pieces the mass of each piece and how far away it is. Because we don't have, we, we, these things are spheres, but the spheres in the table is for a rotation about an axis that goes right through their center. That's not the case we have here. These are rotating about an axis off of their center, but what we'll do is say, well, these are small enough. We'll just take them to be point masses at some distance away from the axis, and we'll leave it at that. That will give us a good first estimate of the moment of inertia of this, uh, this space station model. Let's see. Uh, this one has a moment of inertia of m times its distance squared from the axis rotation, which we'll take to be r. So the first one has a moment of inertia of mr squared. It's a pretty small mass. It's small enough that it's far away. We don't really care about its size compared to everything else. If we needed to, if this was a big sphere, we could figure out how much uh, the fact that it's all rotating at uh, a different distance. But this is a small enough mass. We'll take it all to be at some distance r squared. It'll be pretty good. What's the moment of inertia of this little piece so that we can sum them all together? It's also mr squared. And this piece. And this piece. So it's just... 4 mr squared. Simple as that. You'll have a couple homework problems where you've got some relatively small object of some mass rotating at some distance away from a center of axis and just doing the sum of mr squared will be fine because that particular thing doesn't happen to exist in the table. So you have to do something else. Now, Maybe you, in a fit of brilliance, comes by and says, let's take that same space station same, same scientific modules attached by some very slender structural members, very, very light. They're so light, notice, 
we didn't even have to take them into the calculation. They're that light. Oh, sorry, John. I didn't know what I've been doing for 10 minutes. Not that anybody else does. <coughs> but you have the, the, the brilliant idea of doing an axis of rotation over there on the edge. So let's do that. See if maybe that's not going to be a better way to do it. If I goes down with this model, we'll save on some kinetic energy getting it to spin at some certain speed. If I goes up, it's going to cost us more kinetic energy and maybe it's an idea we don't want to follow. So the moment of inertia for this model What's the moment of inertia contribution for this first piece? It's m, but it's r is zero. And same for this piece. So these two pieces don't count into it. We're, we're taking, we're take, assuming that that the radius of that piece is much much less than the distance r of these structural <coughs> members. So it just doesn't really contribute. So what's the moment of inertia contribution of this one right there? This one out here at a distance 2r. It's m times its distance squared, but its distance squared is 2r. So it's 4mr squared. What about this one? The same. So there's two. 4mr squares to account for that means its moment of inertia for that structure is 8mr squared. So it's going to take more energy to get this rotating to a certain angular speed. In fact, it's going to take twice as much as it would get to the, this one rotating up to the same speed. And that energy in outer space is going to have to come from somewhere, probably from a, a tanker truck, a tanker shuttle, bringing some gasoline out, pumping it up, getting a little propeller going. No, propellers don't work in outer space. Bill, you knew that, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you have an odd amount, you know, this is nice and even, mm -hmm. you know, just find the center of mass to sort of maximize. Well, you just calculate each piece. If we, if somebody else comes along and says, let's do this space station, because it kind of looks like a star. You just, wherever the axis of rotation is, let's say it's there, each piece is a certain distance away from that axis of rotation. This one happens to lay right on it. And so you just add all those up. It's the m r squared for each one of those little pieces. That's when the size of this is small compared to that distance there. And so we just count it as a, as a little point mass and get a good first cut. Now, uh, that's a quick estimation, though. But for the actual space station, they need to know the moment of inertia about every little piece in pretty, and they need to be pretty accurate about it. They don't want to lose control of the International Space Station someday because they don't quite know what the moment of inertia is. And they have to know it in three-dimensional rotation because at any time they might need to change its position in any possible direction. The fat brother-in-law comes out, gets on one end, that end tilts down, then their pool table doesn't work right because the pool table's tilted. Then they're all angry. They slam their beers down. Half of them are all up there, always rushing anyway. Volatile people. Man. What? You don't think NASA could met a pool table that work in space? You bet they could. That's NASA, man. Did you have any in the balance? Yeah, I was wondering if, if the, in the first example, whether it's very even space or 
Fear. Actually, in any example, if those, the size of those spheres was more significant, yes. could you sort of supplement a cylinder and then say we subtract half uh, of the spheres from No, it? no. There's, there's another technique we have to use where if we have an object and we know it's moment of inertia about an axis through its center, but we want to figure out the moment of inertia about an axis parallel to that. We use what's called the parallel axis theorem. But we don't need that here. Uh, well, I don't, I don't know if it's even given in the book. I know none of the homework problems. Yeah, this, the book doesn't have it. Uh, if you take, if we do a class called dynamics that I teach in the spring sometime, we will figure out a more accurate presentation of this if this size isn't negligible compared to the distance away from the axis, which we're doing now. All right, let's see. Oh yeah, we got a little time. We'll do another, we'll do a quick problem with it. Where we can take this all into account. So imagine we have Mounted to the wall, a a big pulley. Not a big bully, a big pulley. We have a big pulley with uh, attached to it a mass. So you know that when you let go of that mass, it'll start to accelerate as it falls. Uh, is this free fall? Got that object there, I let go of it, gravity pulls it down. Is that free fall? Neglect air resistance. It's not going to be moving very fast. You know, depending on what the mass is, it, it might take a while to actually fall to the bottom. But is that a free fall problem? What, Joe? Yes. Joe says yes. Who thinks Joe's full of hooey? Mm -hmm. On this point, not in general. Nobody, Joe. Everybody? Free fall problem, yes? Len says yes. Mike says yes. Come on, Bill, we were talking about free fall problems yesterday. I, I redefined it for you. What did I say? Uh, it, has, it falls with no outside force, isn't it? The only force in the problem is gravity. What about the rope? What about the rope? It's not falling back. Isn't there going to be some tension in that rope? If you cut that rope, are you saying nothing would change? friction of the rope on the pulley. That's wound, the rope's wound around there. It's not sliding around it. It's just wound around it. So there's no sliding going on. Yeah, there's there's static friction to, to keep it from unwinding, I guess, but it can't be a free fall problem. There's got to be some tension in that rope. No matter unless this thing has no mass, then the rope would have no tension. But other than that, there's going to be a little bit of tension, so it's not a free fall problem. So let us figure it out. Let's see, we'll give this cylinder, but we will say this is a cylinder. You know, pulleys, pulleys are essentially very, very flat cylinders. Maybe sometimes there's a little groove in them, but we won't worry about that. Just take it to be a cylinder. Eight kilograms. Radius 12 centimeters, and of course the axle of it goes right through its center like that. We'll take this to be 117.7 newtons, and it's going to fall a distance of 4.2 meters.
what I'd like us to find is just the split second, the split, split, split second before the mass hits the floor, what's the angular velocity of the pulley? Here's a little hint for us. Uh, we've got an object that's dropping, which means it's losing gravitational potential energy. Where's that gravitational potential energy going? Into the kinetic energy of what? Alan said the mass, you said the pulley. Both, because neither were moving before, now both are moving. And so both will have kinetic energy. The mass will actually have translational kinetic energy, one half mv squared, no sweat. Uh, one half will look up in the book. M, uh, well, we can get M from the weight. And V squared, well, that has to do with how fast it's falling. That has to do with how fast that's spinning. So the work energy equation will actually work quite well for us. Let's write that down. There's no spring in the system, so I won't even put that in. What work is being done in this problem? Huh? Why not? You're just guessing? Why not? There's, what is there to do any work? Well, gravity is there to do some work, but we take care of gravity over here. Don't account for it twice, only account for it once. There is no work going on in this problem. Is there a change in kinetic energy? Yeah, the mass had none, now it's got some, and the pulley had none, now it's got some. So there's definitely a change in kinetic energy. Is there any change in potential energy? Of what? The mass only. The pulley is still where it was when it started. It didn't fall down any. But the mass most certainly did. We'll assume that the rope itself doesn't have any significant mass. I got it over at Ace, and they, they sell massless, stretchless ropes over there. They're perfect for us. Delta K. Uh, of what again? What has some kinetic energy change? Yeah, both things do. So let's figure out the change in kinetic energy for the pulley and the change in kinetic energy for the mass and just add them together. That's what's kind of cool about this work energy equation. It's just an accounting problem. Whatever's in the problem, count them all up and add them all together. As long as you don't miss anything, it's, it works out great. Change in kinetic energy of the pulley. What's that going to look like? That's, of course, Ke2 minus Ke1 for the pulley. It's what? Let's see, the kinetic energy of the pulley is one half I omega squared. Remember that I is the MR square integration already done for us for this pulley, which we'll take to be a very flat cylinder. So um, delta KP then is what? Delta KP. 
wouldn't it be one half i would factor out of both terms because there's going to be kp2 minus kp1. One half i is in the set, both of them, and it's common to both. It doesn't change, it comes out. One is zero. Times v2 squared, mi or sorry, omega 2 squared minus omega 1 squared. Does that look right? For delta, the change in kinetic energy of the pulley. Phil, that doesn't look right? What looks better? What looks wrong? Let's see. Let's write it out more completely. Uh, so that's KP2 minus KP1. Right? Kinetic energy of the pulley, the change in kinetic energy of the pulley which is KP2 is 1 half I omega 2 squared. Right? Yeah. Minus 1 half I omega 1 squared. 1 half and I are constant, common to both terms, factors out. <coughs> leaving behind omega 2 squared minus omega 1 squared. Is that the same as omega 2 minus omega 1 quantity squared? Good. We talked about it yesterday, didn't we? In this case it is? Omega 1 is just 0. Oh, because one of them is 0. Yeah, but otherwise, no. And if I were you, and the way I love to wield the red pen, I wouldn't make that change yet. Uh, omega 1 is 0, because it starts from rest. The whole system starts from rest. So delta Kp is 1 half I omega 2 squared. Omega 2 we're looking for. What's the kinetic energy change of the mass itself? Starts from rest. Some amount of time later, it just is getting to the bottom with some velocity v2. So what's its change in kinetic energy? Delta k of the mass. Well, same, same kind of thing, Km2 minus Km1. What's the initial kinetic energy of the mass? Zero. It's not moving yet. The whole system starts from rest. So, it's only the kinetic energy it ends up with, one half mv squared, one half mv and v2 squared. Because in this case, both of the initial values dropped out. Doesn't always happen, but in this case it did. So that's the delta K term. What's the delta UG term? G delta H of what? The mass. The pulley doesn't go anywhere. It's mounted to the wall. Look at that. That's high tensile 
strength concrete with bolts put through it. That's not going anywhere. So it's mg delta h. What's mg? Hot. That's mg right there, isn't it? Because the units is newtons, that must be its weight. So there's mg right there. 117.7 newtons times g. 9.8 meters per second squared. That will give us a. Will that be the right units? No, I delta a. What I was yeah, putting yeah. mg again. I was getting so excited. I'm so used to doing mg. I didn't know I already had it. So I want. What do I want in there? That's different from what they said. Oh, he's right. Well, how, how does it feel to say that, Alan? All right, Mike. Minus, because it's dropping. Uh, that you can figure out directly, especially now that I wrote it down correctly. What is it? Who's got it? It's is what? Minus 494 Minus Newton meters. So now our work energy equation is zero equals one half comes out of both terms I omega squared plus M B squared, oh two. Minus 494. Is that right? Is that the work energy equation now? Okay. A couple things we still need. We need I. What is I? How do we find it? Cylinder yeah, it's, it's it's a cylinder. So it's either the third picture or the fourth picture. Which is it? Which one of those pictures is spinning like this one spinning? It's the third. It's the third picture. It's a in fact that looks like a pulley. If you turn it 90 degrees, that's exactly the picture we got there of our pulley. It looks just like it. And so its moment of inertia is one half m r squared. And we got all those numbers. One half, eight kilograms, and R. Let's see, we're gonna we got everything else in meters and stuff, so we're gonna need that in meters. So what's that come out to be? What's that come out to be? 0 0.06 meters. 0 0.06. You agree that those digits? 0 0.0. Somebody either confirm it or deny it. How hard is one half eight times 0 0.12 squared? Whole class should be. Okay, 0 0.06. Finally confirmed after 20 or 30 minutes. 0 0.06. What are the units? That's the units for moment of inertia. Remember, we're not talking about just mass moving. It's also important where that mass is. And that looks awful lot like m r squared that we got moment of inertia from in the first place. So there's the moment of inertia of the object. Uh, what's this m? It's the mass of the this falling weight. Len, you have it there? 12 kilograms. 
All right, so now our work energy equation, uh, one half I I is zero six meters per second squared times omega two squared, which we're looking for, right? We're looking for that. Plus mv2 squared, m is 12 kilograms, v2 squared, we don't know how fast the pulley's fallen either, I mean the, uh, the mass is, minus 494, all of this newton meters. That, that's just plugging in the values that we now have, we now have i, we now have m, did I get it okay? How many unknowns in there? Two unknowns. We're looking for omega 2. We don't have V2. We don't know how fast the object hits the deck either. We need a second equation. Two unknowns. We need two equations. There's one equation. We need two equations. What's our second equation? We don't know the acceleration. We would if it was a free fall problem, but it's not. If it's not a free fall problem, we don't know the acceleration. Conservation of momentum. Well, that's not going to work. How much momentum does the system start with? Zero. It's just sitting there ends up with some momentum. That's because it picked up energy, which increased the momentum too. What's our third equation? I mean, sorry, our second equation. We've got one equation, two unknowns. We need a second equation. Yeah, it's got to be, some, well, it doesn't have to be, but that would sure help us. If we had something that related those two velocities. Is there anything that relates the speed of this pulley to the speed of the mass? So wouldn't it be true that the speed of the mass is directly related to the angular speed of the pulley by how far of the radius of the pulley. What's the equation that relates those two? V equals R omega. That's only true if the Rope isn't slipping. If the rope is slipping, then they won't. That velocity relationship won't hold, will it? Because the rope would be slipping off at some other speed we wouldn't know about. So there's our second equation: v two equals r omega two, where r we are using capital R for the radius of the pulley. And there's our second equation. Now we can. We can put them together. We're looking for omega 2, so let's take out V2, put in R omega for it. And then we can just solve for omega 2, which is just an algebra problem now, so I won't make you do it. 65.5 radians per second. Okay.
comfortable with that? Joey, you're not comfortable. Your thumb hurts. I'm home, aren't you? Mom, um, you get me. I'll go down to the nurse's office and lie in that little green vinyl couch. So, well, so maybe I, I will. So I assume it's a center of mass of that rotational object moves as well. It's not as simple as just adding your linear and rotational. Oh, no, no. I, you know, if this was attached to a, okay. something that, you know, the side of an elevator or something, yeah, then we have, we'd have to take that into account, yeah. Or if the rope wasn't a rope, but a very heavy chain, we'd have to take that into account, because we've got to get it turning around. It's all mass that needs to be accelerated. That's what's happening here, where it's mass that needs to be accelerated, as well as that mass needs to be accelerated. And we have to take that into account too. All right. Any questions with this before I take it down? We do the next thing, Mike. Oh, so the velocity and the uh, omega move at the same time. Is that like always? Huh? Like they not change. No. It's going to be. You can always uh, move the velocity to omega and these. If if there's no slipping going on. Which we're assuming there's not. Assuming that that rope is nice and snug on there. Okay. Next thing we need to look at. Let's see. In fact, it's related to this problem in a way. And in fact, we're going to. Uh, this will be next week's lab. Our last lab for the term is very much like that. All right. Um, um, Remember, it was, it was a, sort of at this point when we were looking at particle motion, when we made our shift from kinematics to kinetics. What did we start talking about when we started talking about kinetics? We had, uh, and still have, this business of every linear equivalent has a rotational equivalent. We even found that out to be true for mass. We now have this idea of rotational mass, not just how much mass there is, but where it is. We even had a kinetic energy, which we get just by swapping in the variables we had above. But when we were done talking about these things, started talking about kinetics, that's when mass finally came into the picture. But what else came into the picture? Sorry, John, what'd you say? Force. Yeah, force. We started talking about force. We started talking about how do we get an acceleration that we need? Or how do we figure out what the acceleration is? And we brought in this idea that F equals M A. So far, everything we've done in a linear fashion had some rotational equivalent. You might expect that that's the same thing here. So let's see if we can figure out what it is. We already know M would be I and A would be alpha, but we don't know what to do with mat with force yet. So let's see if we can figure out what the deal is with force and rotational motion. All right, let's see. We've got some some object here. Pinned so that it can rotate freely at the center. And we're going to apply a force to it and see what happens. So I'm going to apply a force right like that. This, this thing has some mass and it has some radius. What's going to happen? What then will be the acceleration of that object? Nothing. Remember, it's pinned at the center. It can rotate, it can spin, but it can't go anywhere. It can't 
translate in a linear fashion. So it's obvious that we can't just put an, whatever we had a force here causing acceleration. We can't just put a force there and say hey, that causes acceleration, then and, and we're all set. We can keep going. So there's got to be some other some other idea to it. So what if I took the same object, same mass, same radius, even the same force, except I move the force a little bit. What if I take the force? and instead apply it over there. Will that make that thing start to spin? Will that give that thing an alpha? Sure it will. You can even, we, without even knowing anything about this kind of business, you just show up here, you know, just fell off the turnip truck, you can figure that that alpha is going to be in that direction because that's what that force is going to do to spinning things. All right, let's see. Let's see if we can take this a, a step farther. This one might not be as obvious. Same object, same mass, same force. Only this time, I apply it a little bit differently to some spot maybe right there. Is that going to cause that thing to accelerate at the same rate? It's going to have uh, some kind of angular acceleration in that direction. It's still going to do that, but Suspicion is it wouldn't be as big. Is that the general feeling? Alan, you feel like that that's true? A couple of the others feel like that's true? That that's, and that's indeed the fact. If we, if we were able to do this experiment uh, in some way, we, we find exactly this. So it appears that the distance the force is from the point of rotation has an effect. If it's zero, we get no acceleration. If it's big, we get a lot of acceleration. If it's somewhere in between, we get somewhere in between acceleration. And that's exactly the deal. We call this kind of thing a force applied at some distance from a center rotation. We call this torque. French word for torque. I want to write that, so we need some symbol for it. Uh, every other time, well, except for mass when we used I, but every other time we came up with a Greek letter. So we're going to have a Greek letter here. It's called tau. It sort of looks like a one-legged pie, give or take a little bit. Uh, remember when you write reports, we don't write out T-A-U because we don't need to. That symbol is available there in the word processors. Torque is equal to the force being applied times the perpendicular distance that force is away from the center which for this picture was R, for this picture was zero, for that picture maybe that's R over two, something like that. So I'll just call it D. That's the perpendicular distance the force is from the center of rotation. This is known as the moment arm. Maybe you've heard that term. So we now have our rotational equivalent of F equals MA. 
there could be more than one torque because we could have one force at one distance and another force at some other distance. So we, we have to take into account all of the torques. There might be some torques trying to spin it counterclockwise, some trying to spin it counterclockwise, like friction might be doing. And we've got to add all those up to see what the effect is going to be. So we're going to have to sum all the torques. That will cause an object with some moment of inertia to accelerate. And there's our rotational equivalent of F equals MA. It actually is a, a vector, because this could happen in three-dimensional space. A force could be off in any direction. It could be in any direction itself. And the object can be oriented, oriented in any, any way. So it really is a three-dimensional thing. We'll take it to be two-dimensional. The objects we talk about can only spin in the plane of the board or in the plane of your paper. The force is only going to lie in that plane as well. The radius is only going to lie in that plane as well. So we'll take it just to be a simple two-dimensional thing in that the acceleration is either clockwise or counterclockwise. That's all that can happen. All right, so we've got this, this idea of force at some distance. So let's, let's put it to work real quick in a, in a quick example. Imagine we're lifting some girder or something. Maybe, maybe you're going to put in a new deck. So I've got this. You're coming down to help me for some extra credit. So we've got this 10 meter girder. I like a big deck. 30, 30 foot deck. So we're lifting that by means of, of some crane here, which is pulling up on a wire attached to one end. Let's put this thing at uh, Thirty-eight degrees. Why not? Thirty-eight is an awesome number. Tension in the line is twenty thousand newtons. My question is, how much torque is being applied to that girder? Because if it's being lifted like that, it's going to tend to sort of rotate around that end. So we have an object that's in some kind of rotational type motion. And so uh, let's figure out the torque. Now, before we get going too far, let's think about this a little bit. Let's think about what we got. Oh, I shouldn't. Let me, yeah, let me, well, I can put one of those back real quick. We have this kind of thing. Oh, I call that D, I guess. So we we'll call it D. It's the perpendicular disc. It happens to be the radius. In this same example, so I'll put them both down because they happen to be one and the same here. That was our original picture for torque. We have something a little bit different here because this force is not perpendicular to the line that connects it to where the point of rotation, which would be right back here somewhere. Yeah. You tell me. What are the units on force? Newtons. 
What are the units on distance? Meters. Newton meters. However, this is not joules. Because remember, joules was from work where the force and the distance were in the same direction as each other. Here, the force and the distance are perpendicular to each other. That's very different. So this is not a joule here as we use it. Only a fool will call that a joule. That's the only physics wrap there is. It's just that long, too. It's the only about four words or whatever that was. So we have a slightly different situation here because this force is not perpendicular to this distance back to the point of rotation. It's not a big deal for us because we can take that force, break it into perpendicular components. So there's one part of the force that goes that way. That is perpendicular to the line that goes back to the point of rotation. And there's one part of the force that's right there. Let's call this one the force parallel and this <coughs> one the force perpendicular because that's what we need. We need force perpendicular to the line going back to the point of rotation. How much torque is this part contributing? <coughs> okay, John. You're going to die. I want to turn the camera so we can put it on YouTube. Thanks. Appreciate it. How much torque is this piece contributing? It's perpendicular to the line going back to the point of rotation. We know the length of that line. If we could find that co component, the torque <coughs> contributed by it would be F by L, where L is the length of the ladder itself. Alan? Be, be just the same, just take that tension line and run it down the ground. This is from rotation to point. Where you tell me. Yes, it would be. How much torque is contributed by this part of the force? Because this one force, remember, is no different than these two forces doing the same thing at the same time. How much torque does that force contribute? Why none? That force points right through the point of rotation, so its distance, perpendicular distance from the point of rotation is zero. Any force that goes right through the center doesn't do any torque. That was the very first picture we had up there anyway. So no torque from that part, only a torque from the perpendicular part. And you can figure out what that component is because we know from, uh, from the trigonometry what the deal is here. Turns out that angle there is also 38 degrees. And you can, you can uh, pull that together if you think about the geometry a little bit. So the perpendicular component is that big and we've got those numbers and the distance back to the center rotation is the 10 meters uh, I guess we we're calling it oh called it L here same as the D we had over there whatever the L just makes more sense for the length of a girder D doesn't make any sense for length of that dang yeah that's not even worth writing down is it So how much torque is being applied to? Somebody else confirm that? Okay. 158. 
158 kilonewton meters. Now, time to go, but what we can do real quick on Monday is we'll take this problem again. We can, I'll give you some mass of this. We'll figure out how much angular acceleration of the girder that will cause. If we're, if we're pulling up on it, it's going to rotate about that point. So we'll figure that out on Monday. We'll need a mass of that girder, and then it's angular, I'm sorry, it's moment of inertia. 